So today we begin our summer series, Hot Summer Sundays. And the series is going to be a little different than, than normal, okay? Um, I, I went to a, a preaching seminar. That's not why it's different, but just to, to share with you, you know, and they said that the typical sermon is, depending on your faith background, your traditions, is three, uh, three points in a prayer or a poem, three points in a poem or three points in a hell story. Um, so it, this, is, this is a little different uh, as we go through this. And th because uh, historically in the summer, church attendance declines to just the, the faithful few who truly love God and the church. So <laughs> you guys are in that group. And, um, but what that does is it may, you know, typically, so everything I think in the world is, is, is cyclic, cyclic, right? Um, and, and God intended it that way. I mean, he, you know, he created for six days and took a break. Uh, there's seasons, uh, you know, it, well, in California, there's, there's a fall season and then summer uh, in this area. A uh, little bit of a winter for a couple of days when it gets cold. But, um, and so in, in church, it's the same thing. And typically in the fall, you know, people will want to go back to church. But in the summer, everyone's busy. Uh, the problems that they were facing with their kids in school or, you know, this and that kind of get pushed to the side. And in the summertime, they're not really thinking about God or the church. Uh, not, not universally true because we did meet some people this week as we were going out doing some of the mission stuff for Acts 1-8, handing out water bottles, having ice cream socials, prayer walks and stuff. People that were really interested, uh, you know, oh, yeah, that church on the corner. I heard that so many times. That church, you know, I drive by there. I've been meaning to stop by. I've been wondering about that church. Um, so we invited them all to come. But, but typically it's, you know, again, uh, this is the perfect time to maybe teach a little deeper, a little differently than we would normally the rest of the year. Um, and so Hot Summer Sundays is not something that was intended to be, um, oh, now I can't think of that word. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're dealing with some things that are controversial in society. Um, so it wasn't designed to entice people to come, ooh, what are they going to talk about type of thing, um, but more like, you know, how to address things. And so we start with the Bible. Today we're talking about the Bible. Is the Bible God's word? And, and, and the reason behind that is, um, is foundational to all the other stuff that we're talking about. And the world, I don't know if you've realized this, has moved on. Okay? How many people, and I can tell just by looking at your faces, um, if your face is like really young, then you won't remember this. But how many people had one or maybe two phones in the house, one in your parents' bedroom and one in the kitchen, and at least one of them was a rotary phone? <laughs> yeah, all the hands go, okay. <laughs> and, and what happened if you weren't home when somebody called? It just rang. <laughs> um, you know, and... If you wanted to get a hold of somebody, you, you called them when they were home. Well, people go into church then, uh, and a typical church service or a typical church Sunday would be you go to church and you either went to the, the worship service first or Sunday school. Um, in fact, there's a little Southern Baptist church in Roswell that they do this. They have first Sunday school, okay? So people go there for Sunday school. Then they go to the worship service. So the preacher teaches and then he preaches uh, then you have a potluck lunch, and then you go home and take a nap, and then you come back in the evening for more teaching. Um, and they're all different teaching. So the Christian, the knowledge of the Christian faith was pretty deep and solid. Um, now we have the Internet, and we have access to more knowledge than ever before, and, and yet people are more ignorant of their Christian faith. Uh, and same thing with the Bible. You can pull the Bible up on your phone, uh, on your iPad, your computer, you can pull up 17 different translations, and yet Bible knowledge has decreased. So, as we're looking at these topics, um, by the way, they're going to be next week is uh, who is Jesus, you know, and then the week after that, is Jesus the only way? Is Christianity the only way? And then we'll talk about hell and suffering and sex and some other things, all based on what the Bible says. And again, um, I think I said it before, but on your communication card, if you have questions, the last two weeks are reserved for a potpourri. Guys, that means a mix of things, okay? 
usually fragrant. But basically, it's like, what are your questions? And, and I want to try and answer those questions that you may have those last two weeks. Otherwise, I got to come up with something, um, more videos or something. I don't know. But um, so, if you have questions as we're going through this, or there's something that you want to know that we didn't cover that you're thinking about, write those down, put them on your communication card, and turn them in, and and we'll uh, try to cover those. So, this is why we're doing this. Okay. So the Bible is foundational because as Christians, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. That means God, this holy supreme being, has revealed himself, not just through creation, where anybody can look and go, okay, this kind of points to a creator, um, but specifically who that creator is, why he created things, why he created us, what his relationship is with mankind, uh, and all those things. And so we find these things in the Bible, okay? So as I wrestle with these questions, I want to know what God says about them, the Bible. I don't want to know what the Internet says. I don't want to know what some celebrity says. I don't want to know what your cousin who knows a guy says about these things. We could have great conversations, but ultimately I want to find the truth um, in the Bible. So I spent a good part of a semester in seminary. I was on the five and a half year plan for a three year degree and uh, spent a good deal of time in the Bible. But uh, learning about how this book came about, this book, the Bible. Um, who wrote it, some fancy words and terminologies about it, how we ended up with the 66 books that make up the Protestant Holy Bible. Uh, as the video said, in the Catholic Bible, there's, there's more, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. But um, I could spend, I always say, like I said, I spent a semester. I don't have time this morning to cover all that stuff. So I summarized some of those things on an insert in your bulletin. Uh, it's got some things about the Bible. It's got some fancy vocabulary words. It will be a test next week. And then on the other side of that are some daily devotionals for Monday through Saturday where you can start to spend a little time in the Word or maybe a little extra time because you got more daylight and, and answer some of those questions. So uh, as I cover the things uh, on the insert, we should be on the insert slide right now, sorry. Uh, I want to cover a few main ideas and, and implications and instructions in reference to the Bible, uh, the viewing the Bible as God's Word. But yeah, refer to the insert there uh, for more detailed information. Like I said, you'll see some of those vocabulary words as well as some background on the Bible and, and things like that. F.F. F. Bruce wrote a good book. Uh, I want to say it's called The Canon of Scripture. I could be wrong, but it's definitely by F.F. F. Bruce um, that really goes into detail about all that you know, who wrote the different books, how we got all these things. So how we got them, okay, it, it's in your insert there as well, but basically uh, several centuries B.C. before Christ, the, the 66 books of the Old Testament had been canonized by the Jews. Uh, they said these are our holy books. For 400 years before Christ came, there was Silence. Silence. Uh, no prophet of God spoke to the people. Things happened, and, and those books are recorded in what we call the Apocrypha, which are those extra books in the Catholic Bible. Uh, they cover the intertestamental period between the Old, Old Testament and the New Testament. And basically, those are history books, but even the Jews said those weren't inspired by God. They're just history, so to speak. And then along came Jesus. And the four Gospels talk about Jesus' life and, and the church, and, and uh, those things go on, as it's said there. So how we got these books is through a process called canonization. Now, canon means a, a set number, right, a list, but it also means a standard by which this list was created. So those, again, those 39 books, did I say 66 earlier? I did, huh? Shame on me. 39 books of the Old Testament and the way I remember that, three times nine is 27, and that's how many are in the New Testament. See, 39 and 27. 39 in the old, 27 in the new. It's the new math. All right. <laughs> so those 39 books of the Old Testament had been canonized. They said, these are scriptures. These are the word of God. And then later on, the church said, well, we've got all these writings. Uh, how do we decide which ones are the word of God and which ones are not? 
And they went through this process and they said these 27 books uh, that are in our New Testament are the Word of God. So let me explain canonization a little bit here with uh, a Star Wars analogy. Dun, 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 dun. Um, anybody see the Star Wars movie? All right, the original 1976 in the theaters when it played there for however long? Okay. Um, Disney, the Disney machine took over the Star Wars empire recently. And they plan on making new movies. What they got with that was the six movies, the three original and then the three prequel movies. But beyond that, there's this thing called the expanded universe. And it's the cartoon series, The Clone Wars. It's all the books that were written. It's the action figures. It's uh, all these things that filled in the blanks that the movies lacked. You know, who was Darth Vader's mother? Who, you know, I, I mean, all these things. Uh, what happened to Boba Fett after, you know, did, you know, uh, okay, so I'm going crazy here, but there's this huge thing called the expanded universe. And so as Disney says, all right, we've got our six movies, we've got this big mess of expanded universe, if we're going to create new movies, how do we tie all this together? So they said, we need to canonize the Star Wars material. Those six movies, a lot of money was spent making them, a lot of money was made showing them, so those have to be truth. Everything else outside of those six movies is not true, and so we can just ignore it and write whatever storyline we want. So according to Disney, the six movies are the canon of Star Wars, everything else is extra stuff. This is what happened with the New Testament. As it was being put together at a period of time, uh, you'll see it's the Council of Carthage, Carthage who decided in the 5th century what books made up the New Testament. And it had to measure up to a standard. It had to be inspired by God. It had to be the apostles. It had to be the Word of God. Um, and then, again, the list that compiled. And the reason they did this is because there was false doctrine going out there. There was people saying that Jesus wasn't really a man uh, it was just an image. He's God, but it was just an image, you know, a, a mirage, if you will. Um, there were people saying all kinds of crazy things like that. And so they said, look, here's the truth of the gospel. God created everything. He created man. Man sinned. Sin entered the world. There had to be a price for sin. That's what all the Old Testament sacrifices were about. Jesus came to earth. God became man and dwelt among us fully God, fully man, lived a perfect sinless life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for sin. He died on the cross as payment for all of our sins. He was buried, he left those sins in the grave, and he was raised on the third day, just as we will be someday raised from the dead. The resurrection is the hope because the sins are paid for on the cross. So everything in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament points to the cross, Everything in the New Testament points back to the cross. See, the cross is central. And so with this doctrine in place, anything that didn't fit that didn't measure up to the standards, the canon of Scripture. There was, there was the gospel according to Thomas. Has anyone read that? You should read it sometime. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> Jesus as a child formed pigeons out of clay and animated them, gave them life, and they became real pigeons. Some other child thought that that was silly. That may, I forget if that was the reason why, but some other child mocked child Jesus. Child Jesus got mad and struck that child dead. Would that be a sin? It would be murder. So that would not be a perfect sinless life of Jesus Christ, right? So they looked at things like that and go, yeah, that's a cute story, but it's really just a fairy tale and it's not true. It's not part of the canon of Scripture. Keep out. So, when we look at these books that we have that make up the Bible, we can know some things about it, okay? Truth, justice, and answers for a godly way. We know that the things that are in this Bible are true. Not all truth in the world is in this Bible, but all things that are in this Bible are true. Justice. While this Bible tells the story of God's love, it also tells about God's justice. 
which is a difficult thing for some people to deal with. Uh, because justice means that there's a price to be paid, and if people don't accept the price from Jesus, then they got to pay it themselves. And that means an eternity of separation from God in hell. And some people don't like that. It's funny how that works. Um, I think everybody has an innate sense of justice. Uh, when we've been wronged, we know it, and the person that wronged us deserves justice, right? But if we wrong somebody else, we deserve mercy. Uh-huh. So the Bible tells us about God's love and justice. And it also provides, again, answers for the godly way. As we seek to follow Jesus, because Christians are followers of Jesus Christ, uh, we search the scriptures and see, hey, how does he want us to live our life? What is God's plan for our life? Um, and so this Bible then is the source book for anybody who's pursuing a relationship with God. It's not the book for everything. If you tried to teach mathematics out of this, it would be a complete train wreck. But if you want to learn how to follow God, this is the perfect choice. Okay? So, the New Testament tells about Jesus. Christians are followers of Jesus Christ. Why do we look at the Old Testament at all? Well, I'll give you 200 plus reasons why. You ready? You got a blank sheet for notes, okay? In the New Testament writings, the Old Testament is quoted over 200 times. For Christians in the first century, the Old Testament was the Bible. It was the scriptures. They searched it and they found how it pointed to Jesus. And then they told the stories about Jesus afterwards. So that's why we say the Old Testament is still valid. Now, this is different than some other religions. They'll say, yes, this was God's word then, but people misinterpreted it, people weren't using it right, and so now this new revelation from God, this is what we follow. But Christians still say, no, you know what? This is still the valid word of God. It's still useful for us in our lives today. The Bible is not the work of just one man in one lifetime, but over 40 different men in many different lifetimes, thousands of years, uh, many different writings, and yet there's one unified theme and so all of these reasons, you know, when I was a police officer, we would look at all the evidence, not just one fact, but all the different facts. We called it the totality of circumstances. And so when you start investigating and looking at these things, the totality of circumstances adds up to this being a very special book. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the first four books of the New Testament, Jesus speaks. In some Bibles, those letters, those words are in red, so you know that that's Jesus speaking. Jesus is God. When God speaks, that's God's word. So whenever Jesus is written down as speaking, this is God's word. Jesus said many times, it is written, right? It is written. When he says it is written, what is he referring to? The Old Testament, okay? So the Bible is the word of God because Jesus is God. When he quotes the Old Testament, it validates the Old Testament being the word of God. In fact, he said, particularly, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very word of God, as he's tempted by the devil. So that talks about the Old Testament and the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what about Acts and all these other letters? Well, they're telling the story of Jesus. And as you investigate them, you even see that the people at the time writing them believed that these were the word of God. Peter, in his letter, 2 Peter, in fact, let's look at this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It's towards the back of the New Testament there. Earlier in his letter, uh, in this letter, he writes... Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. So he's saying that no man is going to speak prophecy. Prophecy is something from God. No man is going to speak that of their own will. Okay, it's going to be inspired is one of your vocabulary words, which means that the Holy Spirit is guiding that person along. Um, and that's what he says. No man, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
But in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter refers to Paul. And he says there, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him. Stop there. So Peter wrote two letters, First and Second Peter. Those are what we have. Uh, there's more letters, by the way, that are not included in the New Testament. We just lost them. Uh, when we read, in fact, as the elders, we've been reading through First and Second Corinthians. We're in Second Corinthians now. Uh, as you read through those, you can determine that Paul wrote probably at least four letters to the Corinthians, but only two of those got saved and included in the Bible. Um, there are more copies, old copies, original, not originals, but uh, early copies of this manuscript, thousands more than any other ancient work of literature. Okay, we look at Homer's Iliad, and we go, oh, yeah, Homer wrote that, and it's the story, and everyone believes it. There's just a couple hundred copies, old copies of that, but there's over 5,400, excuse me, 4,500 copies of the New Testament from, you know, the second and third century. Uh, so the fact that this book has been around, it's been a number one bestseller for years, it, again, speaks to its specialness. But he says that, uh, you know, Paul writes these things. Paul wrote at least 13 letters in the New Testament. I believe 14. I credit Hebrews to him, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, all we know for sure is that Hebrews was included in the canon of Scripture, and somebody wrote it, and then we can argue for days about who that actually was, because it doesn't say. But in verse 16 now, 2 Peter 3, 16, this should encourage all of us who have trouble reading the Bible and understanding it. Okay? Peter one of the three guys that sat at the feet of Jesus got to see all those special things about Jesus, probably knew more about Jesus than anybody else, writes this about Paul's letters, uh, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, <laughs> which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So Peter says that, hey, uh, Paul writes these things and he writes about salvation, and this is God's word. Um, and yeah, some of those things are hard to understand. But don't let that be an excuse to not read the Bible. Okay? Uh, I can read Revelation and not really understand it, but that doesn't stop me from reading it. Uh, I can read Paul's writings and not really understand it completely, uh, but that doesn't stop me from reading it. Okay? Uh, the Bible is the word of God. And there's all kinds of distractions to time, spending time in it. One is, you know, gosh, it's so difficult to read. When you eat food that you have not prepared yourself, whether you've gone out or you've gone somewhere or your spouse or child has cooked that meal for you, do you know all of the ingredients in that food? Do you understand how all those ingredients work together to make that food? but you know you need to eat, right? Same thing with the Bible. You may not understand it all, you may not understand how it all came about, but you know you need to spend time with God, and this is the best way to do that. As for the ignorant and unstable twisting things to their own destruction, again, that's how we said, you know what, this is not the Word of God because it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive with everything else. And there are false teachings out there still to this day. So, difficult scripture false teachers, all these things make it easy for us to choose to not read the Bible. Um, there's other obstacles and distractions that can keep us away from it as well. In Proverbs 7, 21 through 27, picture there, it talks about an adulteress. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you, and he revealed himself to us through this word. That's why he gave us this word, because of his love and desire to have a relationship. Unfortunately, there's a whole world out there that wants to distract us from that. It's competing for our attention. It distracts us uh, from our relationship with God. And there's also people out there who will try to discredit the Bible. Has anyone uh, in sharing their faith ever had anyone ask, well, what about all the errors in the Bible? I see a couple of heads nodding. You know what my response has been? Fortunately, I had a Bible with me. I say, show me. And they can't because all they're doing is spouting propaganda. 
You know, oh, there's errors in the Bible. What are they? I don't know. I've just heard that there's errors in the Bible. There are some things that are hard to understand, but there is nothing in here that cannot be examined and explained logically as to why it seems to be an error. Uh, but that's the thing. There's, there's that. There's TV. There's Internet. There's all kinds of things that distract us. Uh, let me shock you for a second. The world is a whore, okay? It's an adulteress. And it's trying to take you away from your loving relationship with your Father in heaven. He wants you completely. He sent his son to die on the cross to redeem you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he wants that relationship with you. So don't let the world distract you from that. Proverbs 7, 21 through 27 talks about this very thing, trying to be distracted from your relationship. If you want to know God, do what Christians for centuries have been doing. Spend time in his word. All right. There's no better way to know the Bible, to know God, than to actually spend time in the Bible. And here's my confession. It took me years to learn that. It took me years. I would read books about the Bible. I mean, solid books that drew on their, you know, their points from the Bible, but when it got to the quotations of Scripture, I would skip over that. I wouldn't look it up myself. I would read those books more than I would read the Bible. Now I read this. I read a lot of books, but I still read this more than anything else. Um, you're not going to find a quick fix to Bible knowledge. But like any good thing that takes time and work, spending time in this is. So what are the implications of this? Well, if the Bible is God's word, and I believe it is, what does that say to God when you choose to ignore its teachings? What does that say to God when you choose to denigrate it or belittle it? Or... Uh, when you choose to ignore it and seek your wisdom elsewhere, what is that message you're sending to God? If you don't view the Bible as God's word, then when you have questions about topics, you're going to find those answers somewhere. Is it going to be Wikipedia? Which is a great place to start, and anybody can start there and write whatever they want. Is it going to be your cousin? Is it going to be your feelings, which probably have changed three or four times in this hour we've been together? Or is it going to be the Bible, which is a collection of writings held to be sacred for centuries that speak about God? People have died believing in this, what this teaches. Okay, so here we are. Now is the time. You guys have been sitting long enough. Stand with me for the reading of the word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Every Awana child knows this. Every Awana teacher probably does too. We're going to say it together. 2 Timothy 3, 16 is on the screen. That's it. Wow, it's a beautiful color. Sorry. Ready? All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Mine says competent, sorry, complete. Same thing. Let me pray about that. Father God, thank you uh, for your word, for Paul's teaching to Timothy, uh, for the truth of this very thing today, Lord. Uh, all scripture is breathed out, inspired by you, and, and we can use it for all these things. So, Lord, as we do that, as we search out a relationship with you, as we spend time with you, uh, let your word change us from the inside out. I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated, and let's tear this apart. Inspired, uh, breathed out by God. Translations will say different things, but they all mean the same thing, that Scripture is from God. 
inspiration of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit possessed that writer and made them write what God wanted to write. That doesn't mean that it sat there, Holy Spirit, that he sat there and whispered in their ear, write this, write this, write this. He didn't dictate it. But as the person was writing these things down, the Holy Spirit was there superintending, overseeing, uh, breathing out the things to make sure that the writer wrote in their own voice what God wanted to communicate at the time. That's what it means by being breathed out. There's four things in that particular passage there that all Scripture is useful for, profitable for. Teaching, reproof, correction, and training. Teaching's pretty easy. Well, no, if you're a teacher, you, you, you're like, no, it ain't. What are you talking about? Teaching is not easy. Uh, I mean, explaining what teaching means in this particular context is easy. Don't mean to offend anybody, okay? Uh, it means you want to know about God? The Bible will teach you about that. How did God create the world? Well, look in Genesis. It'll tell you about that. Uh, how, do, how is sin treated? The Bible will teach you about that. It'll give you the information, the knowledge. This is what teaching uh, means. How do I live a godly life? Read Paul's letters. He'll tell you all about that. Put off the old self. Put on the new self. Teaching. Reproof uh, and correction are similar, but slightly different. Uh, reproof um, is also rebuking, uh, convicting of sin. So as you learn about God and, and the way you're supposed to live your life, the Bible teaches you that. And as you stray from that path, the Bible will convict you or rebuke you or reproof you of your sin. Uh, and oftentimes it's painful and sharp, like this. Oh, I just stepped off the path. And that cut me to my heart. The correction part is, okay, here's what you need to do to get back on that path. Right? Uh, the Bible says, a man who looks at a woman with lust in his eyes has committed adultery in his heart. You stepped off that path by looking at a woman with lust. What do you do? Confess your sin to God first and accept that forgiveness. And uh, depending on how bad it was, maybe you need to confess your sin to somebody else and apologize to them. That is the correcting, getting back off the path. Training in righteousness is, okay, now here's what you need to do to stay on that path. We've identified those things that trip you up, God is saying, and I want to work with you to keep you on that path so that you live your life in a godly manner. And those are the things that the Bible is useful for. The Bible is God's change agent. How many people like change? How many people are ADD and said, I've changed three times this morning? <laughs> Not many people like change. Usually we don't like change at all unless it's change that we want to make, right? Therefore, realize this, that you're not who God wants you to be. He loves you just as you are, but he wants so much more for you. He wants you to be conformed to the image of his son. And that doesn't mean grow your hair long, get a beard, have your teeth whitened, right? So when you're smiling, Jesus, people see your radiance. That means the way Jesus lived his life was in obedience to God the Father. And this is exactly what God the Father wants for you too, okay? Uh, no self-help book is going to do that. It'll modify your behavior, but it won't change you inside. We can modify our behavior all day long, but once we stop doing that, we go back to that old behavior. But the Bible is God's change agent, okay? Uh, the best, the best self-help books are Bible-based because it's based on the Word of God. Uh, so why go through those? Cut out the middleman. Go straight to the source. Straight to the source, okay? And here's how to spend time in God's Word. Let me give you the recipe. Three ingredients. You ready? Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, and New Testament. And I know Psalms and Proverbs are in the Old Testament. I get it. But when you want to spend time learning about God and reading stories about the past, that's the Old Testament, okay? Spend a little time in the Old Testament. The Psalms are poetry. They are people crying out to God. So when you're going through a tough time, like 
really bad, gosh, awful time? Read Psalm 88. I cry out day and night before you, is what the little subheading is. But you spend some time in the Psalms. You need to learn things, you need to get wise. Spend time in Proverbs. It's a book of wisdom. Pithy little saving sayings. It talks a lot about the fool, the sluggard, and it talks about wisdom, things to avoid. And then the New Testament, that starts with Matthew and his stories about Jesus and about the church and its instructions for Christians, again, on how to live a godly life. So those three ingredients, Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, and New Testament. Okay? If you don't read the Bible, if you don't read the Bible, God's not going to love you any less than he already does. But you won't know how much he truly loves you because it's all in here. So as the band comes up, let me give you something here. What's my reaction to the Bible as God's Word? It's the thought for the week. What is my reaction to the Bible as God's Word? Think about that. Because um, some people say, hey, it's a good book, it's interesting. But I'm saying it's God's Word. And if you're ignoring it, if you're not spending time in it, you're not, the things that you're doing to God. Okay? What are the implications of my reaction? God provided this for us to know him. And if you're choosing not to spend time with him, what's the implication of that? If you say, hey, I know there's answers in the Bible, in God's word, but I'm going to find them elsewhere. What are the implications of that? So think about that this week. And then there's next steps. And these are on the back of your communication cards. Again, uh, you fill out your communication cards. You can drop them in the drop boxes there. Um, oh, Here's the next steps. I will treat the Bible as God's word. Or I'm still thinking about this one. Or my thoughts and actions are my own concern. And you can mark those. You can look up what it says, the Proverbs things that I referenced there um, later on. But I'd like to pray for you. And I want to be able to communicate to you as well. So this is why we've been talking about turning in the communication cards with your current address. Um, praise God, you know, I was looking through some of these and uh, communication cards, and I see that you guys are truly, some of you are truly, truly, I mean, really living the Christian faith out, Christian community, um, because there's about 10 families that live at the same address, S-A-M-E. So I need the zip code for same, because that's what you've put down as your address. Um, the same one that you think we have may not be the one that we actually have. And so we just want to make sure that that's correct. But uh, you fill out your communication cards, turn them in the box. Think about the Bible as God's word. And let me pray so we can sing. Father God, thank you uh, for this, this specific revelation of the Bible as your word, from which we're going to learn all kinds of things this summer, God, uh, more and more about you. May we spend time every day in your word because it's spending time with you and you are so worthy of that devotion and attention. You gave it all for us. I pray that we can give some to you, Lord. May you be glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.